Good morning, Tim. Morning, Gary. Nice to see you, mate. So you're finally out of lockdown. Yeah, interesting little data. The only state in Australia now that has zero infections is Victoria. Today, we, for the first time ever, are at zero. Queensland yesterday was at 12 and uh, WA at 39. And amazingly, we're locked out of those states. And I really am mystified as to why our Premier doesn't say to them, well, we'll lock you out instead. But anyway, it's a strange world we live in. Right. So this is another episode of Horse Racing Junkies. This is episode five. Um, Welcome, everybody. Looking forward to having another chat with Gaz for the next 30 minutes about anything racing and some of our black bookers as well. But Gary's got a, a little bit of uh, price-driven information that he wants to talk about this morning. So I'll pass over to you, mate. Yep, okay. So look, uh, I just thought I'd go through with uh, subscribers and uh, listeners about a couple of things. One of the things I find, and by the way, this is an excellent book if anyone's ever looking for something on this subject I'm talking about. It's called The Perfect Bet. Uh, Bet. It's by Adam Kosharsky, and it's basically about how science and math are taking the luck out of gambling. But look, there's a lot of other books as well similar. What it's about is that people don't quite understand that when you do ratings and really go deep into form, because it's not only about once you've got a figure, you've then got to work out and what is the right price and make a lot of different additions. What can sometimes be your best bet can also be a lay bet. Why is that? Because if I price a horse that I need $3, if the horse actually is back two twenty into a dollar seventy, and on the fair I could go back and lay it if I wanted to play bookie at a dollar seventy five, that becomes an excellent lay because I've priced it at three dollars, right? Now I'm saying this horse realistically at three dollars it has a sixty set by me, it has a sixty seven percent chance of losing, right? Because I'm saying at $3, which is two to one in the old system, you've got a 33% chance of winning. The market has turned around and said you're about a 60% chance of winning. I think that's wrong. So therefore, I can reverse the bet. But in the scenario where, and it has happened occasionally, because especially when you're betting in secondary markets and um, a lot of things are driven these days by obviously uh, some could be stable information. We have big syndicates or whatever. That horse, you could price a horse, at, and this has happened, you can price it at $3. It becomes an excellent lay because it's trading early, $1.70. You can lay it at $1.80. But once the horse then drifts out to $3.50, you can then become from being a fantastic lay to being a, a great bet. Yep. So what people have to do, and I know if you, a lot of your subscribers, they've got to understand that it is all price-driven. If, if, you, if, you, if you're getting uh, selections and ratings of someone who's actually taken the time to go deep, do the right prices and give you a price, it is price driven. The difference between that and no, not wanting to knock necessarily all the people who just give a tip or somebody you know, owns a horse or whatever else, that's a tip. But most people who give tips and the people on the TV and all that, they give what they think will win the race. But they don't know what price it is. And my, my thing is this. The horse, I, as I said, the horse I think is a good is at three dollars, maybe a bad bet because it's unders. Whereas I often make good money, and over the weekend I've had a a, a very good last uh, couple of days, where my second selections cleaned up on Saturday, Sunday for me because my top selections were underlays. It allowed me to back several nine to one and eight dollar fifty winners because I'd priced them around four dollars to four fifty, and the other ones were too short. So really, it's price driven. And the way to make money, and it's is a bit like this. If if you're buying a share and it's good value at ten dollars, it probably isn't good value at fourteen dollars. Because if it goes up from ten dollars to twelve dollars, then all of a sudden you've made, you know, you're looking at making a twenty percent profit. Yep. But if you bought it at four earnings and it goes down to twelve, you're losing twenty percent. Yep. Right. So, you know, those who understand the share market properly and can price accurately uh, shares, whether they be ASX or whatever else, accurately, that's what they do. So they buy, they sell. That's what day trading. There is no real difference to what we're doing when we do horse race analysis and do trading on our horses with our ratings is very similar to those who say they're an expert and they're a day trader, which I am which I do not understand is so much more prestigious to the to a lot of people out there in the real world 
But believe me, whether you're doing horse ratings or you're a futures trader on sugar or coffee, if you're doing a deep dive analyst into that particular market and you're making a profit and you're making a good income out of it, then that's an excellent way of making money. That's an excellent business. Yep. There is no difference. And I think that's a sad perception of the world. I agree 100% with you. You, 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 you Like a prime example, you're saying about the three to one. See, on Saturday, I had a good example was I had Right You Are at $2.70. The best you could get on the bookies was $2. To me, that's a lay all day. Yep. And that's what you have to, if, it, if it's running in that, doesn't matter how much money's on the thing, it could be the biggest money mover in the world. Yep. But I've got the money wrong. You know? Absolutely. And, 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 and I think I think the other thing is, look, the, the other thing very important uh, with racing and uh, look, obviously because of COVID, whatever else, and, uh, and you know, change of, uh, well, I've done ratings and all that for many years, more years than I want to really admit, but, you know, um, about 40 years now. Um, believe me, I've done it a lot more now. This is my primary uh, way of doing things. Uh, I've had the time to really go in depth and everything else. And that is the key. If you go in depth, spend all the time into it, no matter what you do. Oh, but I can tell you, while I've had some really good months this year and I'm, and, I'm, and I'm certainly in front and doing well, I've had some horror runs. We all do. And in racing or anything you do, you're going to have really bad weeks or whatever else. That's why you've got to keep your results. The most important thing is it's what percentage are up overall. That's it. And once that race is over and, and that day's racing's over, you just got to get up the next morning, shake your head and go back and go deep, go dive and find out and get into the next day's ratings. But don't necessarily change. You're always looking in the game, I find, of what, how to improve and looking at new ways and innovative ways to look at form. But at the end of the day, just because you have a bad run doesn't mean what you're doing is wrong. Yeah. And I think yeah. that's pretty much yeah. the same. People who play properties or whatever else, they go up and down. Whether you're playing shares, everything, can, everything in anything that you can use, it goes up and down. Now, you know, I'm not a casino uh, trader person playing uh, those games because the other side of it is this. If you go and play a coin toss in a casino, they'd be betting you about a dollar ninety, whether you bet heads or tails. Not that that's a bet you could do, but this is an easy way to explain it. But if somebody wanted to come to me and say, hey, pick any coin because I want to make certain it's not a double-sided coin, I'll give you $2.20. I'll, bet, I'll stay there with you till you go broke. The bottom line is, I could still have a losing run, but you will lose your money, right? We won't sleep till you are broke. But yeah. if you're betting a dollar ninety, I I can't win. Even if I have a great run early, casinos make money because if a person goes in with two thousand dollars, they don't want you to go have two one thousand even money bets. That would they wouldn't be in business. No. What they want people to do is break that to have forty fifty dollar bets, losing bets, and what people do who play blackjack or that, and look, there's some very good players, but what a lot of people do is they play for fun or whatever, and whatever they're going to bet, 500000 whatever it may be, they play till they lose. If they're having a good run, and if they have a really good run early and they're up four or 500 they don't go, well, now I'm stopping. They keep going, and it comes in runs, but the percentages are against them. That's why that's corporate, that's corporates don't like taking on big, big punters because – you know, I know for a fact from when I'm working for them, they want the $500 punter that does $5 bets because they yeah. know that they are not going to win. They know that. Well, and that's right. And I mean, it's, it's a bit like, uh, I won't mention it, but I got, I got uh, there's, there's one that was giving these uh, football AFL bets uh, earlier this year. And uh, not that I played AFL a bit, but they were giving it if you were in front at half time, you got paid out, whatever. The thing is, I was hardly winning. And it was it was limited bets to, I think, $100 or whatever else. I couldn't believe that after three or four weeks, and I was only up a few hundred, I, they sent me an email saying, I now can't have those bets. Right? Because I had a few that won. And I'm going, hang on. I don't take crazy ones. When I don't take the odds on, I was backing the ones in the black because that's the way I am. Right? But I thought they were a good chance to lead at halftime and lose the game. Yeah. Bottom line is they don't like anyone who's betting smart on their proposition bets. Now, fortunately, in Australia, we do have the minimum bet laws, so corporates do have to bet to that on win betting, and that, that's fine. But on the ones that are offering the super promos or whatever else, 
you will find it's limited to whatever. What they're really wanting to do is induce, like you said, the people who bet $20 bets, $5 bets or whatever, but they're going to have a heap of them and they're never going to withdraw their money till they lose and all they keep doing is putting the money in. And, and, the, and the biggest thing they do, they used to have where they say, we'll match what you've got. We'll get you put 500 and we'll give you 500 credit. As yeah. a, you know, we'll match what you put in. And that was, you know, I worked for a place and that was a prime example with them because they know the moment you get into credit with them, you're fucked. Yeah, yeah you're that's stuck right. Stuck with them for life. That's right. But the prop, fortunately now the law is that they can't do that in most states. It's, no. It has changed. The no. federal government changed that. Um, I've never been one who ever, ever had credit betting, wouldn't believe in it, but I do know, uh, well, there's, there's a few famous ones that have been in the financial review that, uh, you know, they had on the hook for massive amounts of money. Yep. Because, you know, the thing I've always said, racing or any of these areas, whether you're into shares or anything, works as long as you don't gamble, which means you've got to know when to bet, when not to bet, yep. and not have to bet. Right? And I've written articles on that, when to bet, when not to bet too. Yeah, but it is, it is very important that you uh, don't, because you're losing... And that's what more of what I'm about. The problem in why casinos make money is, one, they induce and they actually don't mind people drinking. They certainly have, um, you know, ATMs uh, nearby, if not directly in the casino now, but they're certainly next to it. And people, unfortunately, and go to a casino at midnight because as soon as the banks let you go the next day, the one at the, the Gold Coast there used to be famous for, if you go near it, near where the lift used to be, there was people queued up waiting for the, the midnight to click over so they could drain their next day's uh, ATM amount because they yep. lost, right? That's the sad thing, right? At the end of the day, you've got to know this is what I've got to bet with and it's not going to affect your lifestyle. That's why I always say to people, everyone, what bank do you use? What's How much? And they say, well, what size of the bank? I said, well, if you're just an average punter, 1%, because if you've got $5,000, you've got $50 bets, you've got 100 before you go broke. If you go broke over 100 bets, you shouldn't be pumping. No, well, that's exactly right. And that's what a lot of – but what if you've got that, and that's what they need to do, what they don't want to do is if they've lost $400, then try, oh, I've got to get my 400 back and go and put 400 on the even money shot, yep. which is a bad bet, and then they're down 800 At the end of the day uh, – I've rarely found anyone to pump their way out of disaster, right? Yep. And as I said, no matter how much I put into the time and the effort of doing form, I have some horrible days and I have some horrible weeks. The well, good, fortunate thing is my good ones outweigh the bad ones and the most important thing in the game, and no matter, and I've met over the years some very good players who have been and sustained it for many, many years, they'll all tell you they've had horrible runs. Yeah, Peter well, would I mean, you only have the bank. Look. Yeah, you only have to look at the Racebook website where we've got the graphs and things like that. Every single year, we tend to have a horror run around August, September, before the carnival starts. Because yep. they're so that the fields are so even, you've got benchmark 64s and benchmark 58s. There's no class to race. There's a million first up horses, you know, that are coming into races. And it's so hard to rate. But because you've got a service, you, you give these guys yep. the and you go through it and you can just about see every year we are either just break even or we have a losing run. Or the odd year we've been really lucky and hit some really long shots, real long shots. Oh, well, a absolutely. You just you just dropped off, mate. Oh, you're back. I'm back. Yep. So anyway, mate, talk about your lay and you talk about your lay and your, your prices. Why don't we um, – because that what you're talking about the lay and the price that's green booking, yeah. You know, what yep. they call on Betfair is green booking. So it means if you're smart at green booking, it costs you nothing to have a bet. Yeah, that, and, and look, that's actually right. That that is exactly correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So and I'm a big talk. Like I've got a third article on green booking, the way it works. And a lot of guys don't understand how it works, but like you've you've explained it to a T, where you're saying if you rate it three to one and they're offering you two to one. It's a lay, but if you've got it three to one and you're saying it's a lay in the morning, it goes out to five to one, it's actually a good bet. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's and I think I think if you look uh, and for those who get into laying, that's why sometimes uh, again, if you believe the horse is gonna drift and you've got it at a particular price, you can go in and buy it early on bet there because you'll get you'll you'll find people take that shorter price early because a lot of yep. people perceive it will um, 
short and not lay. And if you're accurate, that's a way of doing it as well. Yeah, it's, and, uh, and your yeah. battle is a win. You act doesn't matter whether it wins or loses. You still got to make the increment in between. Absolutely, and that's that, and that's certainly another way uh, of hedge betting. And there's some very good uh, players out there who um, who do that very successfully. And that's an extra way of people that can look at things and a, a different way to look at ratings. And they can take it and yeah, uh, you, know, you can you can skin a cat in this game many different ways. Exactly, and that's about doing the homework as well. You know, like oh, absolutely. You know, and look, I look, I also think that you know. Um, with people who, who get ratings like from yourself or whatever else. I mean, the other thing is it, it points them in the right direction and then they can have a look at it themselves and go, well, this is a really good bet. And because of this, I think this, this – and if you've got it uh, at a particular – you might have a horse at $9. And then they look at it and go, it's now tra- – it's, it's been bet at $3. I think, one, one you, you think it's definitely under the odds. They can agree with you because of what they're looking for. And I think people should always do their own little bit of – understanding of racing because I think it helps them even if they're getting good tips uh, and then they can go and lay it. But I mean, again, there's a lot of different ways that people should look at betting. It's not just about backing this horse at that price at the tote uh, bet fair or at corporates. I mean, um, you know, it's, it's also uh, understanding and following markets is very important because the other, other factor, which we can talk in, in another episode and something I do and spend a lot of time on is, understanding when to bet, when not to bet, and when to wait for the markets to change. And we are in a different world uh, as opposed to um, two years ago, I would have said there's a lot more nine o'clock bets. Now the market's changed dramatically because of the, uh, the, the pot tax, as they call it. A lot of the markets are still at 132% with eight or nine minutes to go. But when they actually jump, they're down to about 118, 119%. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's why a lot of those horses ease out. And on the fair... If you like a horse that's at a longer price and it's easing, the pla- a lot of the people who lay on Betfair seem to throw out the crazy prices, the horses who are not in the top three or four. So, therefore, it may be only $12 on the tote. And at the corporates, you can, I often get $21 or $23 on Betfair on the same horse. Yes. So there's people there who just want to lay long shots, and obviously yeah. that works for them because not many of them win. But, you know, they can be very good bets. And that, that's like some of the ones where I've rated it. You know, like the horse that won in Sydney, seven dollars fifty it was, and it paid four hundred and ninety three dollars on bet fair. Yep. You know, there's no way in the world you cannot have a bet on a horse like that when it rates that short. No, no. Racing, when you've got six to one the field and a thirteen horse field, and your one horse in the race has a three hundred point difference, and you rate it seven fifty, you got to back it. Because, you know, it's chances of winning on the race. Yeah, absolutely. Abs- oh, absolutely. Look, I, I agree with you on certainly on the other area as well. If I have a, a race where I have a lot of chances and over the 5 or $6 a field, then certainly I'm much more inclined to be going towards my longer price ones. And in you know, other races where I'm probably more about the pointy end because there's only a couple of chances. And that's why every race is very different. Uh, and there's a different way of playing and understanding the strategy for every race is a different strategy as well of how you need to play them based on how many chances there are. And it's all about percentages. Exactly. And that, that horse I was talking about, it had on the day, I think it had two and a half thousand on it. And someone tried to say to me that there'd been no money on it. I said, well, how can it have match money of two and a half thousand when you're saying there's no money on it? Because otherwise the pool percentage would not be what it is. If you're saying yeah. no one's backed it. Yeah, well, that's right. And I mean, if people are using um, Fairbot, Bet Angel, or whatever else, any of the trading software, um, then that will also show them exactly how much was traded, what was done, and what they can actually do. And, and of course, there's a lot of good automation these days where people can actually set their own prices in it. And if, and if, if somebody does go, I find on Fair, sometimes a horse could be trading corporates at 12s, it's trading on Betfair at 16s. I'll put it up at 23s. Yep. Just leaving it there and somebody kindly goes in and I'll be the only person who got the bet. I'll get, you know, I might want it for a hundred dollars or something and somebody will go give me, you know, eighty dollars of it. it, it it's it's a it's a um it's a strange thing, and I might be the only one that's showing there. But you know, there's some people who just get on to that play the fair and just don't like a horse. Yeah. And they go, Well, I'll take the odds. And, and I that's fine. I never like a horse because I like it. I like no, a horse no. if all my statistics are telling me. It's in the right race. Well, and absolutely. And for me, it's all about percentages. When I do a race, it's all about the percentages. 
and where I've assessed the risk afterwards and what price I'm prepared to take. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, the way I play it differently is I do my ratings and everything, but then I look and what is the price I'm happy to take that if I can get this price, I'll show a good profit and I think it's a good bet. Yeah. And if I don't get the price, I don't do it. And the other thing I must say to people, if you are doing ratings and whatever, the biggest difference between doing ratings and tips is you must live with the fact that underlays will win. If you can't live with it, ratings are not for you. Yes. Right? <laughs> and, and what I will tell you, what is if people have to back winners, seriously, just back the favourite on the Betfair or corporates with 30 seconds to go, you'll back a lot of winners. There's only one guaranteed thing. You will lose about 15% on turnover overall. Yeah. Back a lot of winners, yeah. but you will lose money, right? Yeah. But the actual market on tipping winners, there's no tipster out tips the market over a year. No. But they don't make money because you're taking under the odds. So a lot of guys have said to me, when you say there's a, a market and there's a, a horse that's getting absolutely thumped, how do you know if it's smart money? And I say to them, look at the, the prices they're trying to get matched underneath the price of the horse. Yeah. Look at the size of the bets they're trying to put in. If they're doing 10s, 20s, 25s, $100 bets, it's all the mug punters. But if yep. you see guys that are trying to put 22, 23, 24,000 and trying to get matched on it, that yep. and... Oh, ab abs abs absolutely. And in fact, in the secondary markets where I bet a lot, and the reason why, whether you're using Bet Angel and I use Fairbot, there's a lot of other, other ones out there as well. I do look at with the ones I want with the ladders, you can see the, the, the bets. And like you say, where there's a there's there's certain horses that may have traded and the the biggest bets are like multiples of two hundred and hundred dollar bets, and then you've got one where there's been one bet of fifteen hundred or two thousand, which is a bit uh when you're talking about a Ballon or a Mullumbar. Yeah, yeah. That's smart money, especially if they got on early. Yes. That means somebody connected or somebody who knows what they're doing actually has had a bet. And sometimes you might see that bet for three, four, five thousand, and then all the rest. And to and go people, through it, you've got to sit there and you've got to go through every single oh yeah. course to try and find what the smart money is. Well, the final thing is this that on a day like yesterday for, for doing um, Ballina, while I rated six races, I took six hours of doing the form to do the six races. Yep. And that's, you know, that's not easy because it's not only about doing a rating. It's like 20 minutes to do your map properly. And I like to accurately look at every horse the whole lot, where they're going to map before I really get into doing. Then I've got my ratings and there's a lot of other areas I put them through in an x-ray. But what I'm saying is to do them properly, I then understand all my chances, all the horses. So I'm not surprised in that last bit. And I'm happy then to go and back my judgment. If the horse is drifting or easing, I'm pretty confident I know why. Um, and... I'm happy to back that. And look, I, I, you know, the more you do, you, you work out why horses. The other thing is you get to work out why horses also firm because the big syndicates are looking for favourable jockeys, favourable mapping, certain other factors they look for. So if you think the horse you want to back has those in their form guide, I get on earlier when I think the price is right because they are things that I know those syndicates are probably going to back. Well, if there's a horse I really like that's weak on certain areas, I know the probability is through experience, it'll probably ease and I'll wait and I'll bet late. Yeah. Well, it's the right. same as with what you were talking about too, about people don't take into account the wides. When a horse no. is one, two or three wide, and what they don't realise is if a horse is three wide in the running for a whole circuit, it's got to run an extra 100 metres. The yeah, well, there's a lot of different lengths. And look, I do calculate that. I also calculate if they're wide, no cover. Even too wide, no cover. You're still carrying a lot more distance. And the other thing is, if you sit OSL outside the leader, right, and you're making all that extra work, have a look at horses who go OSL first up and follow them up second up and third up how well they go. That's a very good fitness run, right? Yeah. And look, the other thing is a lot of people don't take into account the track layouts. I mean, it's one thing to say about horses Horses out wide, yes, you can get to the lead. And if you just miss it slightly, you can get that extra momentum. But not if you've only got 150 metres or 200 metres to the turn. Yes. You've got to ride like the, you've got to ride them out hard. And the problem is a horse is not a car. You can't just move it from third gear down to first gear, whatever else. So if they get too revved up and on the weekend I lost on one or two, which got too revved up, they got to the lead, but somebody else took them on. And then they're going helter-skelter. In fact, one of the horses I'll talk about is one of my horses to follow is Knight on the weekend. It got there. It was taken on by a long shot. It was actually a really good run because it knocked up and ran third, but it actually was an extremely good run because 
there was about 10, 12 lengths then to the third horse. Yes. Because do they give up or no? And, you know, that's the thing. You can't always map for that. Um, we don't all know every jockey's intention. And those are the, the hidden uh, characteristics. And then racing, and that's why I say it's important to be very structured, bet to certain percentages, because believe me, there are, when somebody say, says, what's your best bet for the day? While I rate each race or whatever else, quite often I've, I've mapped it on how it should be, what the past says it should be on mapping and all that. But, you know, one in every four or five races, you shake your head because a long shot decides that all of a sudden, They've decided they're going to run it upside down and have a go today and see how it goes. Yeah. And if the other one takes it on, the maps run upside down, the whole lot's upside down. It's a different race. And if the horse who was meant to lead all of a sudden doesn't lead, misses the start, and therefore there's no pace on because this thing's now sitting back in the ruck, it's a different race. Yeah. And that, therefore, is why if you're doing and you're keeping your databases, you know, it's important also to uh, have those characteristics when we're doing future form as yeah. well, because those races may be, um, you know, slow races. Yeah. Another thing I look for is also the uh, horses, that, races that are very slowly run with uh, lead times, et cetera, for the, for the first 800 metres or whatever. They invariably, they go like very slow. It has a very different result to ones that are, you know, well, evenly run or fast run races. Like with you, I spend as much time on the after race as I do the, the yeah. actual race. I absolutely you have to. Yeah, because form is understanding the form of what they've done to what they're going to do. You have to be in the echelon of knowing when to place the horse in the right race. Because I think a class, absolutely. class is one of the biggest indicators of whether in the right class. And I'll, with mine, it tells me whether they're up and down in class, you know, field strength, Compared yep. to the last start. And I, I love, and I've got an indicator that gives me their second last and then their last one. So I know exactly what the field strength is doing, whether they're in the right class of race or whether they're coming into the right class of race. You know, like Stacey Bond, it was down seven and a half kilos in class strength, you know, by yep. my calculations. And the next horse in the race was tooth the time before that or when it hadn't won for about two years and it won it was down 15 and a half kilos in field strength when it won that day and it paid like 45 dollars yeah you know that to me if you're working per you know on every three kilos is one length it's going to get a five point bonus just on field strength yeah yeah that's what makes a huge difference you know they often your 45s and i've got it rated at two dollars 75 and people yep. go, oh, you've got that. And it's the same as what was that horse in Sydney? Um, Brett Sheehan used to or he rode it a few times. Um, okay, used to always lead and it never won a race for about three years, but always ran in the big time races. I'm trying to think of it. It just got retired. Um, it hadn't won a race for about two and a half years. And I made it my best bet at Ramwick one day and it won by about five lengths with Brett Sheehan on it. Can't remember the and, and oh yeah, I can't remember the name of the horse, but again, that's that's the other thing too. Some of these long shots that like to lead, and that's where you've got to also uh, look at what's around them. If no one takes them on, they're the sole leader in the race. They can dictate it all, have it all run to suit, and they can win. The yep. problem then is the others get smart to it. They're not going to allow it to happen. Yes, for a long this while. Day, this yeah. this day when it rated you knew that there was nothing going to take it on. It was going to sit three lengths in front and do it at its own pace. And it did exactly that. And you could tell at the 600, everyone was off the bet trying to chase it and it was cruising. You know? Yeah, and that's... But those horses have then become, while they win that race, they become a very good lay the next race and you don't want to, you want to bet against them because yeah. it's very hard. When, when a horse has everything run to suit, the PR, the perfect run they very rarely will get me able to duplicate that very quickly again, right? Yeah. Um, and that's why, again, I'm looking for the map and who gets the right sort of run because, you know, a sole lone leader, especially in a distance race, that can just amble along and no one take it on is very different to when it's taken on. And then, then of course, as I said, we have a situation like the other day of a, a night of that where the other the long shot takes it on and they both go clear out so far in front, they're both going to die. Yeah, and that exactly. And sets it up for the horse who sits behind them 
right, which was big boy Roy, who comes over the top, which, you know, uh, gets up at uh, nines into sixes. So, but yeah, so hopefully that's a bit of education for the, uh, for the people listening as well. All right, mate. So let's get on to the black bookers. Yep. Um, I'll, I'll start it off with what I've got. Now, I'm going back to when the Sandown meeting was on first, the uh, week before last, and that I've got three out of that meeting. One was in race three, the 1300 metre race, the neighbourhood. Right. I thought that was a great, good sectionals, like you say, great sectionals. I thought that was a great, uh, the way it ran home. And it takes time to get fit. It's one of those horses. And it runs really well at Packham. Now, the guy that trains it wins a lot, right? I uh, yep. like him as a trainer. Um, and that. The other one on the same day in Sounds Race at, at Sandown uh, in the Zipping Classic, Scarlet Dreamer. Now, it finished sixth or seventh, but it was doing its best work at the end. Now, I think it will be placed to advantage because the Hawks train it, and they don't keep horses in their stable just for the sake of running them around. You know, they pay big money, their clients pay big money, and I just think it's right on the verge of winning something at a price. And, and sound was my best bet on the day. Right, so I thought sound was so well placed at the distance in that, but Scarlet Dream, I think, is another one. Now, in the clip stakes, uh, the third place get over the 1800 meters, uh, Papalino. Right now, it was a big, it was a like in the market in the morning, they backed it quite heavily and then they stopped backing it. Right, so I don't think it was a smart money, it was because everyone was talking about it. I'm real dubious of backing horses first up. And the thing you said about, you know, look at how they run first up is quite often just a fitness test for their second up run. And that's another one. Now, I've got three at Ballarat. I've got um, High Excalibration, right, that ran third in the 1,600-metre race of race seven. WT in the Ballarat Cup. I thought that was a big run because it was caught wide and it had to cover a lot of ground. And that... And it's just taken a lot longer as it's got a bit older to be able to get race fit over the 2,000 metres. Now, I had the winner in that race, which was a good win, and that had sixes, and that was Irish Flame. And that only just got there, but that was my second raider in the race. Now, the other one I've got in the 10th race, 1,400, was Ocular. That, flat, yeah, that, that one there, that was, I thought that was a good run over the 1,400. And the only country runner I've had is from Sunday was Fundraiser. If you go and worship Mahushas, they just are so good at placing their horses. But I think it is a city winner, Fundraiser. It's hit its straps, but it won. It made them not look second rate, but it had plenty in the tank when it finished the race. So that's for me, mate. That's my uh, seven horses. Okay, I've got a, I've got a, a, a few. Uh, my top ones are Bombay Knights. It's a Matthew Dunn. Trained horse. It won well yesterday at Ballina. Plenty up its sleeve. It's on It's on the way up. It's been racing in uh, Class 1. I think it's going to be good enough to go Class 2 to a benchmark 64, 1,900 metres around that distance. Maddie's gun's got it super fit, and it runs on the pace, which is a big advantage as well uh, as a stayer because um, the problem with you don't have to rely on the pace being up the front. You can actually make the pace if they wanted to walk as well. So that's a big advantage. The other one is uh, I've got two Kim War horses, both uh, from Saturday, one from Kembla race, one night. It was taken on. I think this horse uh, is perfect in a 14 to 1,600-metre class one type race, yep. uh, benchmark 58. It's, it was a great run to hang on, and uh, it's, it's ready to go next start. The uh, third one um, is a horse that, uh, again, on Saturday uh, was in a class one um, desk. It was at Gosford. Destacado, Kim War trains. I think this ah, is perfect. Yes, I know, yeah, 1,600 to uh, 1,800 metres, class one to class two, 58 to 54 benchmark. I want to be on this. Uh, again, good run on Saturday. Didn't lead like it probably should have, but uh, I want to be on it. And there's two I've got from the uh, Rose Hill Trials, Yep, which I'm both looking for first up. Uh, that is, one is Star Sprangled uh, Rodeo. It's a Bjorn Baker uh, horse. And I think it's perfect uh, midweek Sydney, first up 1,200 to uh, 1,300. I think it'll be perfect. It was fantastic in a 1,030-metre trial. Yep. And the other one is a, um, a maiden 
but it won its uh, trial by 5.75 lengths with excellent sectionals. It's a Chris Waller trained horse called Tight Ropes. And uh, I'm looking for that um, anything from, you know, 1,050 to 1,200 metres. Maiden, I think this one will be going off in the next uh, week or so. But it's fit. It's ready to go. All right, mate. Beautiful. Thank you.